Chapter Three of Our Little Canadian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Our Little Canadian Cousin by Elizabeth Roberts MacDonald. Chapter Three. The day of the picnic was hot, very hot, for June, but that did not discourage the younger picnickers at all. "'It will be pretty warm on the river,' Mr. Merrithew remarked, tentatively, as they sat at dinner. The dining-room windows were open, and the soft air, sweet with the scent of lilacs, blew the white curtains into the room with lazy puffs. "'It will be so lovely when we get to Government House, though,' Marjorie cried. There is always a breeze up there, father, and there are plenty of trees, and three summer houses, and that big veranda. Oh, I think it will be perfect. Yes, Daddy, I do too. I think it will be gorlius, said Jackie. When, after much hurrying about, telephoning to tardy members of the party, and good-natured discussions as to the arrangement of the canoe-loads, they were at last afloat on the blue, shining river. They all agreed with Jack. Dora was charmed with the slender, millicete canoes. She had seen chiefly canvas and wooden ones. Her father, indeed, had owned a bark canoe. But it was of much heavier and broader build than these slim beauties that glided through the water like fairy craft, impelled this way or that, by the slightest turn of the steersman's wrist. They landed just back of the government house, the grounds of which sloped down to the water. The house is a long stone building, with a broad veranda at the back, and in front nearly covered with Virginia creeper. At the time of the picnic it was empty, and in charge of a caretaker, who lived in a small cottage on the grounds. When a suitable spot had been chosen for tea, and the baskets piled close by, Mrs. Merrithew proposed an excursion through the house, and Mr. Merrithew went with Jackie to procure the key. When he returned, they all trooped merrily up the front steps, and soon were dispersed through the great echoing halls and lofty rooms. Most of the grown people of the party had danced here at many a stately ball, for in those days Government House had been kept up in the good old-fashioned way. Marjorie and Jack delighted in hearing their mother tell of her coming out at one of these balls, and how she had been so proud of her first train that she had danced without holding it up, which must have been trying for her partners. Dora was greatly interested in seeing the room where King Edward, then the slim young Prince of Wales, had slept, on the occasion of his visit to Fredericton. When the furniture of Government House was auctioned, a few years before our story opens, the pieces from this room, which should have been kept together as of historic interest, were scattered about among various private purchasers. Mrs. Merrithew described them to Dora, who wished she could have seen the great bed, so wide that it was almost square, with its canopy and drapings of rich crimson, and its gilt prince of whales, feathers, and heavy gold cords and tassels. When they came out of the dim, cool house into the warm air, the elders looked apprehensively at the heavy black clouds which had gathered in the west. That looks ominous, one of the gentlemen said. There will certainly be thunder before night. Thunder! That was Marjorie's horror. Her round, rosy face grew pale, and she clung tightly to her mother's arm. The men and matrons held a hurried consultation, and decided that the storm was probably not very near, and that it would be safe to wait for tea if they hurried things a little. It would be a terrible disappointment to the children, all, at least but Marjorie, to be hurried away without the picnic part of the picnic. So they all bustled about, and in a short time the cloth was spread and well covered with good things. The fire behaved well, as if knowing the need of haste, and the coffee was soon made, and as delicious a picnic coffee but some apparent miracle generally is. By the time the repast was over, the clouds had drawn closer, the air was more sultry, and even the most optimistic admitted that it was high time to start for home. The canoes were quickly loaded, the best canoe men took the paddles, 
and soon they were darting swiftly down river, running a race with the clouds. In spite of their best speed, however, the storm broke before they reached their journey's end. The thunder growled and muttered, a few bright flashes lit up the sultry sky, and just as they landed a tremendous peal caused the most courageous to look grave, while poor Marjorie could scarcely breathe from terror. Then the rain came, and the pretty muslin dresses and flower-trimmed hats looked very dejected before their wearers were safely housed. Still, no one was the worse for that little wedding. Marjorie recovered from her fright as soon as she could nestle down in a dark room with her head in her mother's lap, and they all agreed with Jackie that it had been a gorlious time. Before the children went to bed, Mrs. Merrithew told them about the plan which she had mentioned two days before, and to which Mr. Merrithew had hardly consented. He was to take a whole holiday, on Thursday of the following week, and drive them all up to the Indian village about thirteen miles above town to see the Corpus Christi celebrations. Corpus Christi, a well-known festival in the Roman Catholic Church, is one which has been chosen by the Indians for a special celebration. As it comes in June, and that is such a pleasant time for little excursions, many drive to the Indian village from Fredericton and from the surrounding country to see the millicetes in their holiday mood. The day being fresh and lovely with no clouds but tiny white ones in the sky, Mr. and Mrs. Merrithew and the three children set off early on Thursday morning. They had a roomy two-seated carriage and two big, brisk, white horses, plenty of wraps and umbrellas in case history should repeat itself with another storm, and an ample basket of dainties. The road, winding along the river bank most of the way, was excellent, and the scenery Dora thought prettier than any she had seen. The river was smooth as a mirror, reflecting every tree and bush on its banks. Little islands, green and tree-crested, were scattered all along its shining length. It was almost time for the service when they reached the picturesque little village which went climbing bravely up its hill to the chapel and priest's house near the top. The horses were taken charge of by a sedate young half-breed, evidently proud of his office as the priest man, and our party at once filed into the chapel. A plain enough little structure in itself, today it was beautiful with green bows, ferns, and flowers. The congregation consisted chiefly of Indians and half-breeds with a scattering of interested visitors. Most of the natives were clad in gorgeous finery, some of the older ones having really handsome beaded suits and beautifully worked moccasins, while others were grotesque in their queer combination of the clothes of civilization and savagery. The priest, a tall, good-looking man with piercing eyes, sang high mass, and then the procession formed. First came an altar-boy carrying a cross, then six boys with lighted tapers, and two walking backward scattering bows. These were followed by the priest bearing the host and sheltered by a canopy which four altar-boys carried. These boys were all Indians, and the mild, well-featured millicete faces had lost their stolidity, and were lit up with an expression of half-mystic adoration. After them came the congregation, bareheaded and singing as they walked. Marjorie and Dora clasped hands as they followed, their eyes shining with excitement. They went down the road and entered a schoolhouse not far from the church, where the host was placed in a little tabernacle of green bows while the service was continued. Then the procession reformed and went back to the church. After they had disbanded, the Indians scattered to their houses to prepare for the various other events of the day. Mr. and Mrs. Merrithew and the children were carried off by the priest, whom Mr. Merrithew knew well, to have dinner with him in his house near the chapel. The children stood a little in awe of him at first, but he was so companionable and kind that they were soon quite at their ease. His mother, who kept house for him, was evidently very proud of her son and did her best to entertain his visitors worthily. The house was rather bare, but clean as wax, and the perfection of neatness, while the repast spread on the whitest of linen, was excellent, and not without some rather unusual dainties, such as candied fruits of many colors for the children, and guava jelly brought out especially in Mrs. Merrithew's honor. After dinner the good father offered to show them through the village, and they set out together on a tour of inspection. 
all the full-grown indians the priest told them were holding a powwow in the schoolhouse for the purpose of electing a chief there is no need of my being there this afternoon he said in answer to mr merrithew's inquiry but this evening when they have their feast and their games ah then i will keep my eye on them evidently this priest held very parental relations toward his people the visitors noticed that some boys playing baseball on the green eagerly referred their disputes to him and accepted his word as final he took them into several of the little wooden houses all of which probably in honor of the day were in splendid order in one they found twin papooses brown as autumn beech leaves sleeping side by side in a basket of their mother's making in another a wrinkled old squaw had most dainty moccasins to sell the millicete slipper moccasins with velvet toe pieces beautifully beaded mr merrithew bought a pair for each of his party himself accepted letting them choose their own mrs merrithew promptly selected a pair with yellow velvet on the toes dora's choice had crimson and marjorie's blue while jackie's tiny pair was adorned with the same color as his mother's you see mother dear he said quite seriously yours are a little larger so we won't be mixing them up then being in a gift-making mood mr merrithew bought them each a quaint and pretty basket besides a big substantial scrap basket for his own study and handkerchief cases gorgeous and pink and green for susan and debbie the small baskets all had broad bands of the fragrant sweet hay which grows on many islands of the st john but which very few white people can find dora was much interested in the millicete women with their soft voices and kind quiet faces she tried to learn some of their words and won their hearts by singing two or three songs in french a language which they all understood though they spoke it in a peculiar patois of their own the bright summer afternoon went all too quickly mrs merrithew was anxious to reach home before too late an hour so at five o'clock after tea and cakes they re-embarked for the return trip the horses were fresh the roads good the children just pleasantly tired as they drove on and on through magic sunset light and fragrant summer dusk dora thought drowsily that this was a day she would always remember even if she lived to be as old as the dame who ate the innumerable apples i will have such lovely things to write to father and mother about she murmured in sleepy tones and those were the last words she said till the carriage stopped at the door of the big brick house and she and jackie were tenderly lifted out and half led half carried up the steps then she opened her eyes very wide and looked about her in wonder why i believe i nearly went to sleep for a moment she said and even jackie woke up enough to laugh at that end of chapter three by renee lacroix woodstock ontario canada